Hello, everyone. I would um, say good morning or good afternoon, but I don't know which time zones everybody is in. Uh, so good, good, uh, good, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, and I hope your days are going well. My name is Saeed Atif Rizwan. I'm Assistant Professor of Islamic and Interreligious Studies and Director of the Catholic Muslim Studies Program at Catholic Theological Union here in uh, Chicago, uh, Illinois, and USA. And um, our, our speaker today, who I'm happy to uh, introduce, is Professor Aaron Kohler. He is Professor of Near Eastern Studies at Yeshiva University in uh, New York. And Professor Kohler studies, the, uh, studies languages and histories of the Near East from the late bronze through the rabbinic times. He has written on uh, biblical literature, as well as the history of the Bible and its interpretation, Semitic languages, and Jewish intellectual history. For the, for the past few years, he has been working on the history of writing and the alphabet in particular. He is the author of Unbinding Isaac, The Significance of the Akida for Modern, Modern Jewish Thought, which was released in 2020, as well as Esther in Ancient Jewish Thought, which was released back in 2014. Uh, he serves as editor, as well as uh, author of other books. In 2022 and 23, Professor Kohler was a Bi Fellow at the Cambridge University and a visiting scholar at the Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies at Oxford. He has previously served as a visiting professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and held research fellowships at the Albright Institute for Archaeological Research and the Hartman Institute. In terms of um, housekeeping, before I turn it over, um, you know, Professor Kohler will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, after which we'll do Q&A. During, during the talk, as well as during the Q&A, you can put your questions in the chat box, or you can just use your raise hand icon. Now, I think with Zoom, does it work? No, it's not working. Sometimes you can just raise your hand and the uh, raise hand will come up, but it's not happening. So you'll just have to manually raise your hand and I'll have to facilitate a conversation. Uh, we will go until about um, 1 p.m., uh, sorry, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, New York time. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Aaron Kohler. Thank you very much, Professor Rizwan, and thank you, Thea, for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here. Let me share my screen, and then we will get started. Okay, so hopefully everyone sees my very low-tech slides here. And, yes. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. So I should, I should say, by way of introduction and uh, apology, that I, I'm not a social historian. I'm actually not a modernist at all. Uh, my interest in this topic came from the confluence of being in Cambridge and becoming quite interested in the history of the institution, I think, as one does, uh, especially the intellectual history, <clears throat> while also being a student of rabbinic literature and realizing that there was very little rabbinics in Cambridge. Um, hasn't been anyone officially doing rabbinics professionally there since the re retirement of Professor Nicholas Delange some years ago. And since I was sitting there in the library with the archives and the rare book room, it was natural to delve into the history of the question of rabbinics at Cambridge, which took me back to the Victorian, Victorian area really quickly. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to present some of those findings and thoughts here. Since the resettlement of Jews in England in the 17th century, there was a tradition of translating, popularizing rabbinic texts for the broader Anglo audience. In the 19th century, as some, some prominent Jews moved from the sort of impoverished periphery of British society to the moneyed center, Jewish texts and traditions became a matter of broader interest, um, broader in Anglican society, at least the privileged intellectual society. Now, histories of Jews were a popular genre, but most of them ended at or just after the crucifixion because of the assumption, which was sometimes articulated very explicitly, that at that point, non-Christian Judaism became moribund and was just not worth anyone's interest. Uh, so the very existence of the Talmud, which comes from centuries after Jesus, of course, was a challenge of sorts to the conventional historiography. And people were legitimately curious, like, is it worthy of interest? How can it be? Doesn't that fly in the face of the entire trajectory of history, which are 
culminates with the crucifixion of Jesus and early Christianity. So a Victorian intellectual or a socialite could have learned about the Talmud from two types of literature that were being produced in London. Uh, on the one hand, exposés of sort of depraved Jewish rabbinic culture, and much less popular, writings which laid out the beauty of rabbinic thought. Uh, so the first type we're going to talk about by looking briefly at the missionaries Alexander McCall and Joseph Barclay. And for the second, we'll turn to the influential essay, an influential essay by a man named Emanuel Deutsch. And then at the end, we will also look a bit at the university scene and see what was going on there. All right, so the expose was usually penned by a missionary. We can start with Alexander McCall's The Old Paths, um, published in 1846, with the subtitle, A Comparison of the Principles and Doctrines of Modern Judaism with the Religion of Moses and the Prophets. And you sort of already get where he's going with this. Uh, Professor David Ruderman, who has a recent book focused on McCall, points out that The Old Paths was, quote, the most... Uh, plausibly, the most widely read book of its kind in the 19th century, due to the extraordinary efforts of the London Society to promote the book, to publish it numerous times in large print runs, and to translate it into German, Hebrew, Yiddish, Italian, Polish, Judeo-Persian, and French. Now, the London Society that Professor Ruderman refers to there is the London Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews, which still exists in London under the name Church's Ministry Among the Jewish People. The book itself consisted of a series of 60 articles whose fundamental assumption was articulated by McCall himself in this advertisement to the second edition. <clears throat> I'm just going to read two lines. Uh, the Talmud needs only to be seen as it is in order to be rejected. The reproach attaches not to the victims, but to the authors of tradition. The Jews are a great and noble people, and the majority ignorant of the details of the system, by which they have been bowed down and misrepresented for centuries. Now, McCall handled rabbinic liter literature remarkably well. His examples are drawn not only from Talmud itself, but also from Maimonides' great code of Jewish law, the later Shulchan Aruch. These are not uh, accessible to people without extensive backgrounds and training. He often quotes this in Hebrew, translates into fluid English, and McCall argues, I don't have time to go through a lot of details, but picking up on other themes that are, some of them go back to the New Testament itself, that the scribes made the law impossible to fulfill by the multiplication of details and weighted it down with an impossible burden. Numerous chapters mock the magic and nonsense in rabbinic literature, as well as charms, amulets, incantations. A three-part study of the Jewish New Year contrasts the Jewish view of quote-unquote justification with that found in the Bible appealing to the authority of Moses to prove that the rabbinic texts are fallacious. Part of the appeal of these works, I have to say, was that there was very little knowledge of rabbinics in, Jewish, in, in British society, even among the Jews. Uh, there was, in 1843, David de Aaron de Sola, the Amsterdam-born minister of Bevis Marx, and Maris Rafal of the Birmingham synagogue jointly published a translation of 18 tractates of the Mishnah. I should say that Raphael, a few years later, relocated to New York, where he became better known for his pro-slavery speeches. Uh, and anyway, the Mishnah, this, this project of theirs, um, originated from a contentious synagogue discussion about changes to the liturgy, in which opponents to the changes cited the Mishnah. And they talk about this in their introductions. You see the preface there on the right side. Uh, the argument sort of devolved until it emerged that actually men, of course, we're only dealing with men here, uh, on both sides of the argument, only knew the Mishnah from partial extracts furnished by Christian writers. Uh, in other words, the synagogue leaders also did not know what the Mishnah said about uh, fundamental Jewish teachings. And so they turned to the rabbis to please issue a translation. Now, the aim being basic education, this, there was no attempt made at comprehensiveness, most of the agricultural tractates are omitted, anything related to sacrifice, ritual purity, not included here. And they single out, you see the footnote that I included there in the bottom right, uh, tractates Nida, which is uh, fundamentally about menstrual law, and Yivamot, which is about leveret marriage, as not being suited to the refined notions of the English reader. And for the same reason, they also say that the Hebrew in some places has been substituted for the English. In other words, 
If you know, you know, but if not, we're not going to tell you this is uh, this is not necessarily for refined British gentlemen. Um, now, a second example of the missionary genre comes a few decades later. Joseph Barclay published a book simply entitled The Talmud, published by John Murray. Barclay was a missionary who had worked in Jerusalem uh, for about a decade in the 1860s. And so his Hebrew was very good. Uh, well, that's actually a uh, a fraud. That, that's not such a simple statement as, as it sounds. But anyway, I'll, I'll stick with it for now. Um, when he comes back to England in 1870, uh, he starts working on an anthology of Talmudic passages. Most of them are basically the Mishnah with extracts from the associated Talmud. And in the beginning, he explains that uh, he's omitted passages which are, quote, either too tedious or too gross for general circulation. Um, and when I uh, when I showed this to Simon Goldhill, he pointed out this is really a brilliant rhetorical technique because this way Barclay can make the point that the Talmud is full of tedious and gross things without even having to having to show his readers them. Right? He he demonstrates nothing; he simply presupposes it. Now, the purpose of the book as a whole was a better understanding of the New Testament. This was to be accomplished not by illumination of the text from Jewish sources, which is something we will see later on, but by arguing that the Talmud represents all that Jesus came to repudiate. Um, so, quote, it will be observed that these treatises contain the particular mode of thought against which the deepest woes of the New Testament are denounced. Now, like McCall, I, I should say that Barclay was not a racist. He didn't think that Jews were depraved people. He thought that their degraded ethical state was not because of their constitution or their nature, but because of the Talmud. The Talmud has proved injurious to those who have submitted to its authority. And he actually uh, attributes great influence to the Talmud. Uh, you have some of this on the slide in front of you. Doubtless, their departures from the word of God prepared a way and furnished matter for the numerous heresies and lawless deeds, which form a great portion of the history of mankind. From their errors sprang, at least in part, the Quran. So the Talmud is responsible not only for the uh, deprivations of Judaism, but for Islam as well. Now, Barclay does find moments of sublime beauty in the text. The problem, he explains, is that they are alongside others that are loathsome and others that are blasphemous. And uh, so one last quote here. Mixed up as they are together, they form an extraordinary monument of human industry, human wisdom, and human folly. Now, for reasons that are not clear to me, and I'd be grateful for any insight here, Barclay includes, I, I didn't include this in the uh, slides, unfortunately, a translation of a later rabbinic text called the Baraita de Melechat HaMishkan, which is focused on the layout, the construction of a tabernacle. It's possible that he saw this as relevant to questions of religious architecture, uh, it's, it's many dozens of pages with a fold-out diagram in his book. He clearly devoted a huge amount of time and effort to it, but he never explains why this is important or significant. So if anyone has any insight as to the significance of this in the 19th century context, I would be grateful for that. Now, the one essay that stands totally apart in its uh, role in talking about the Talmud in broader intellectual culture was published in 1867. So between the two books that <clears throat> I was just talking about, and of course, you know, these are just samples. Um, this appeared in the widely read Quarterly Review and was written by Emanuel Deutsch, a Prussian Jew who had come to England in 1855 to work as an assistant in the British Museum Library. And the article was a social phenomenon. It transformed Deutsch, who was entirely unknown, uh, literally into a social celebrity. Um, his other lasting memorial is that he was the Hebrew tutor for George Eliot, and then the model for the character of Mordecai in uh, Daniel Deronda. And when the article was published, it was translated according to one of the uh, memoirists, who I'll talk about in a second, into French, German, Russian, Swedish, Dutch, Danish, Italian, quote unquote, and even Icelandic. Um, the uh, socialite Cornelia Cross, here in her uh, memoir, uh, Red Letter Days of My Life. Uh, you'll notice that on the title page, she is identified as Mrs. Andrew Cross. But anyway, Cornelia Cross um, said that the immense, uh, there was in London all of a sudden, immense interest in reference to everything connected with the Talmud because of the article. 
And she wrote that the writer was Emanuel Deutsch, a name held in much respect by all Orientalists, which is not true, uh, and added, I had on several occasions the pleasure of meeting this remarkable man who, alas, died too early for the full accomplishment of his life's work. I don't know what his life's work would have been, actually. He wrote on numerous different topics. He wrote another long article on Islam, which is interesting uh, in and of itself. The story of Deutsch's death became another topic of conversation. Um, he died quite young. And uh, the following year, another uh, worker in the British Museum named Edward Warren died. And the coroner in that case attributed his death to the working conditions in the museum basement. So um, a man named Stefan Poles, that was not his actual name, but a guy named Stefan Poles wrote a pamphlet called The Actual Condition of the British Museum, where he wrote that Deutsch was, quote, slowly murdered by the studied malice and the petty jealousy of officials who were his superiors in rank and who chafed at the knowledge that they were in every other respect immeasurably below him. Which is partly true, it seems. Um, in any event, Deutsch left all of his papers to Lady Strangford at his death. I'm sorry, let me just switch to the next slide. And she edited and published them and included a beautiful and detailed memoir. I should say that Lady Strangford's name appears nowhere in this entire book. And it took some uh, all, all sorts of paper trails to figure out who had edited this book and written the memoir of his life. Uh, but a couple of people wrote memoirs of him. Deutsch's article was more influential in London intellectual society than the academic world. The Cambridge Dons uh, do not refer to it at all in their writings, although I, I know that William Robertson Smith owned the copies of this book, of The Literary Remains, because it's now in the library of Christ College, Cambridge, uh, with his own name and, and uh, even a couple of notes in it. Now, Deutsch begins his article by arguing that his goal is not to rebut or espouse texts from different cultures, because we children of this latter age are uh, above all things utilitarian. We do not read the Quran, the Zenda, Vesta, the Veda, the Vedas with a sole view of refuting them. We look upon all literature, religious, legal, otherwise, whensoever and wheresoever produced as part and parcel of humanity. And his at least explicit claim is that the same way that Victorian humanists study the classics of Greece and Rome, they should extend the same dignity to the works of the rabbis. In this effort, he says, he has precedence. He says, one of his heroes is Pope Clement V, who in 1307 wanted to know more about the Talmud when he was asked to condemn it. And when he discovered that there was no one who, could who was well enough informed to tell him about it, he proposed that chairs be founded in Paris, Malonia, Oxford, and Salamanca, and they would produce a translation. So he, hopes, he points to Pope Clement as a model of broad humanistic learning. Uh, two centuries later, he points to the great Hebraist Johannes Reuschlin, who defended the Talmud um, by convincing the Pope that objectionable views had to be countered, not burnt. And Deutsch um, dispatches previous efforts at explaining the Talmud in English with uh, the quote that you have in front of you on the slide. Uh, an architectural metaphor. He says, they have given samples from the Talmud exactly as they found them and then stood aside, pointing at them with jeering countenance. For their samples were ludicrous and grotesque beyond expression, but these wise and pious investigators, which is a very generous way of talking about them, unfortunately mistook the gurgoyles, those grinning stone caricatures that mount their thousand years guard over our cathedrals, for the gleaming statues of the saints within. And holding them up to mockery and derision, they cried, These be thy gods, O Israel. Now, Deutsch actually argues two major points about understanding the Talmud, and, and that's all I'll have time for today. First, he argues, the Talmud doesn't come from England. It comes from a world very different. It's a product of the gorgeous East, where all things grow in brighter colors and grow into more fantastic shapes. And then he quotes Goethe, just in Dichte, du verstehen, if you want to understand the poet, you have to go to the poet's land. So that's his first point. Don't try to read this in, in Anglican or English terms. You have to understand this comes from a different world. So this is orientalizing in a really interesting way. 
Second, to undercut the missionary claim that the Talmud is a betrayal of the Bible, Deutsch compares the relationship between the two as comparable to the relationship between the Magna Carta and English law. The Magna Carta provi provides the basic principles, animating spirit, but of course the details are not there. The details you have to go to common law or case law. And in general, this is a good thing, he says. He says, look, the Bible says an eye for an eye, but the Talmud rejects that. Paying measure for measure, he quotes the Talmud as saying, is in God's hand only. And in fact, Deutsch argues that the fact that the Talmud is not just an exposition of the Bible is a badge of pride for the Talmud. It has taken the principles of the Bible, but it's gone beyond it in ethics and morality. I'll give you just one example of what he argues is the humane, refined legislation of the Talmud. Um, he says, the member of the Sanhedrin, you know, the uh, sort of great court that may or may not have ever existed in Jerusalem in, in uh, temple times, had to be a good linguist to the provision about the age, how old the member had to be, and to the proofs required of his vast theoretical and practical knowledge. There came to be added also that wonderfully fine rule that he must be a married man and have children of his own. To that, that is a law, a Talmudic law, that a member of this great court has to be married and have children. Now, Deutsch glosses this with that last line that you see on the slide. Deep miseries of families would be laid before him, and he should bring with him a heart full of sympathy. So he sees in the law a really profound empathy built in. Um, I'm not going to discuss whether that's accurate or not. It doesn't really matter. It's actually a beautifully insightful explanation. And it manages to portray the Talmudic law as pro profoundly humane and even progressive. Now, really intriguingly, despite this very sensitive stance that Deutsch adopts here towards marriage and family, he himself refused to marry uh, throughout his life. Um, one interesting anecdote that I'll have to just uh, end here with Deutsch, uh, talking about Deutsch is that um, there is a passage, uh, there is a passage that I didn't put on the slide, I'm sorry, where as published, he writes, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself is a precept of the Old Testament as our savior himself taught his disciples. Now, because of the phrase our savior and because people couldn't Google other people in those times, Sir Richard Burton and uh, G.R. Mead both assumed, not unreasonably, that Deutsch had converted to Christianity. Uh, but Mead later writes that he was told by someone else that in fact, Deutsch was a Jew his whole life, which surprised him. So he made some inquiries. And he discovered that the editor of the Quarterly Review had changed the name Jesus to Our Lord or Our Savior throughout the article. And that Deutsch was deeply annoyed when he saw this in print in the Literary Remains version, in that book that was published posthumously, uh, Jesus is back. So in both style and substance, Deutsch's article is tailored to an educated Victorian audience presumed to be Christians, familiar with the classics, he quotes Latin here and there, um, and uh, tries to put the Talmud uh, on uh, equal footing with these, with these classics. Now, after Deutsch's death, Victorian society does not seem to have devoted too much energy to Jewish texts, but it was just around the same time, 1866, that Cambridge hired his first rabbinics instructor, the Hungarian rabbi Solomon schiller Shinesi. Um, he was born in Budapest, and after joining the Hungarian Revolution in 1849, he joined. He was then captured and imprisoned. Uh, just before being executed, he escaped, apparently with the help of Jews who were his guards. And he eventually wound up through a series of uh, adventures in Manchester, where he became the rabbi of a small reform Jewish community. By 1865, he had moved to Cambridge and had been hired by Henry Bradshaw, who was not yet the university librarian, but would soon become that, to work in the Cambridge Library. The, the university library, the UL, had received many Hebrew manuscripts from the Duchess of Buckingham in the early 17th century. So we're talking about 250 years earlier. Most of them had never been read in these 1860s, much less cataloged. And Bradshaw wanted them to be. Um, he, in a letter from Bradshaw that we have, uh, in that year, 65, he writes, I have just set a Hungarian rabbi at work upon our Hebrew manuscripts. And with his knowledge and my method of cataloging, I hope it may be a creditable book. schiller Senesi's work in the library must have brought him to the attention of others because in 1866, 
the Senate approved his hiring as teacher of Talmudic and rabbinic literature for a three-year term. Stefan Reif pointed out that there was a lot of opposition to the hiring of a Jew. And even 15 years later, in 1882, 16 years later, um, when the Regis Professorship of Hebrew was open, Shiller Shanesi was disallowed as a candidate because of his faith. And I'll add that that position has still never been held by a Jew. Uh, now, Shiller Shanesi played four roles while in Cambridge. Uh, he was a scholar, particularly a bibliographer and a text critic. He wound up being a spokesperson for Jews in the broader intellectual world. He was a teacher. And he was also an interlocutor in inner Jewish discussions. Um, in practice, these roles often bled into each other. Um, I can't say much about most of these roles. Uh, his catalog, which was six volumes in his own handwriting, only one of which was actually published, in part because he wrote very long, very extensive descriptions of the manuscripts. So the first volume only covers 72 manuscripts. At the same time, you have Adolf ne ne I'm sorry, Neubauer in Oxford, um, whose, man, whose catalogs cover thousands of manuscripts because he writes about a paragraph on each one. Schiller Shanesi might have 10, 12 pages on a manuscript. Um, so his manuscript, his catalog is still in manuscript, ironically, I guess, in the UL, um, except for that one volume that was published. But um, I want to talk more about him as a teacher. Uh, his teaching seems to have brought him into close contact with many faculty members at Cambridge who were, in fact, interested in rabbinic literature. Um, now, Jewish students were very rare in Cambridge at the time. Even the economically elite Jews did not yet regularly attend university. His only Jewish student that I can find at all is someone named Harry Lewis, who actually wound up being a rabbi and holding the same rabbinic post in Manchester that Shiller Senesi had held before he came to Cambridge. Otherwise, his students were humanists and men of the church dedicated to the study of rabbinics and to their rabbinic teacher. There's a lot of personal loyalty here as well. Uh, now, Shiller Shanesi's own most detailed description of his relationship with students comes in the introduction to his edition of the commentary of David Kimchi on the first 41 Psalms. As he tells the story, a number of Cambridge scholars wished to study Psalms with Kimchi's commentary, which is a classic a uh, medieval Jewish commentary, and they were dismayed to find that there was no reliable edition. So they said, well, we have a, a reader in rabbinic here. Uh, so they asked him to prepare one. And he did of the first 41 Psalms. And this is one of the first two critical editions of medieval Jewish texts uh, created in, in Europe in the modern era. Uh, now, for our purposes, the most important uh, aspect of the book is what it really reveals of his relationship with his students. So the book is dedicated to Dr. George Phillips, president of Queen's College, in a flowing Aramaic poem, which I'm not going to read, but you have here, the book doesn't even have a translation of the Aramaic poem uh, in it. So I provided a fairly literal one here. Um, he makes no uh, secret of their religious differences, but there is palpable admiration and affection between Shiller Senesi and his uh, uh, dedicatee, uh, Dr. Philip. And uh, it's really a remarkable intellectual world in which the president of Queen's College can be expected to understand an Aramaic poem. This is, of course, to some extent, to Shiller Senesi's credit, he created part of that world. Uh, he liked to say that he was the disciple of great teachers and the teacher of great disciples. Later in his introduction to the edition, he names the cohort of students involved in the request. And um, so he, this is all written out in Hebrew uh, in the introduction to the to the volume. But here are the names and um, just a bit about the ones who either stayed in the field or went on to become prominent uh, members of the church or otherwise um, I was able to find out something about them. Now, <laughs> I should say that the relationship with uh, some of these, uh, some of them are worth pointing out to so William Wright uh, here at the bottom left linguist and my good friend, is a very prominent scholar of Arabic. There's also another, William Aldous Wright, who's, um, uh, he calls a Sofer Mahir, a quick scribe in the Lord's Torah. B.A. Uh, e. Wallace Budge, uh, later is one of the most prominent British Egyptologists, but at this point he's an undergrad, apparently hanging out with anyone doing Oriental studies. A number of the other people, as you see, were various deans, 
of churches, Hebraists, uh, professors of other Eastern or um, quote unquote Oriental languages. Um, not all of these relationships lasted for that long. We have one letter from William Wright, the Arabist, to a friend in Leiden, who, which I'm not going to read out loud, but he says, I never intend to see or speak to Mr. Shilashanesi again. Uh, and then he tells a story about how they had a big blow up at a meeting um, where they were discussing the possibility of hiring someone to teach Aramaic, and Shilashanesi seems to have been very insulted. And um, so he will never talk to him again in any event. Okay, not on the list of students in this book, but instead singled out for special attention are two of Shiller Senesi's most important disciples and supporters, uh, Dr. Charles Taylor and then William H. Lowe. Charles Taylor, who you can see in the portrait uh, why, but he was known as Jumbo, was master of St. John's College. As St. John, uh, as Shiller Senesi puts it, Adon Midrash Yohanan HaMivaser. So the master of the Midrash, the college, of uh, John the Evangelist, Yochanan Mivaser. Among other texts, he published a Sayings of the Jewish Fathers. He was impressively well-versed in rabbinic Hebrew. But in profound contrast to a writer like Barclay that we talked about a little while ago, Taylor is constantly comparing rabbinic texts to early Christian texts, the New Testament in particular, but never, never in the entire book does he draw contrast between them. Instead, the reader would get the impression that the, these two texts would be great friends. Um, he thinks that this is natural. Both draw on the same wellspring of texts and ideas. He says, for example, that the expression of ideas in the Lord's Prayer may be illustrated from rabbinic writings and for the most part rest ultimately on the Old Testament itself. So he sees rabbinics and early Christian texts as natural bedfellows, drawing from the same wellspring of the biblical tradition. So that's Taylor. He, his name is all over the place now, not only because of, of uh, St. John's College, but because he was later the collaborator and patron of Solomon Schechter. And so the Taylor Schechter Geniza collection is named for him. He gave Schechter the money to buy the Geniza collection in, um, in Egypt. The other person I mentioned is William Henry Lowe. I cannot find a portrait of him anywhere. Um, but he had actually volunteered, he was younger, he volunteered to travel with Shiller Senesi to Paris for work on the edition uh, of Kimchi. And Shiller Senesi writes that the deal was, you be my hands and I will be your eyes. And for five weeks, five days a week, six hours a day in the Parisian summer, they sat in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France um, and Shiller Senesi read out variants from the manuscripts and Lowe meticulously wrote them down. Uh, now, Lowe was an impressive scholar as well. He published a fragment of the Talmud Psachim, which had been extracted from the binding of a 15th century book in the UL. So this goes back sometime before the 15th century. Um, Shiller Senesi dated it to the 9th or 10th century, which would make it one of the oldest fragments of the Talmud. It's hard to know. Um, but Lowe published, it's not just one page, but this is a, an image of one page. Um, published a critical edition of that. That's actually the first critical edition of a Talmudic manuscript ever published. Uh, later, he published an edition of a great uh, Byzantine Mishnah manuscript in the UL's collection. And that was the first great manuscript of the Mishnah to be published. So Lowe became a very important rabbinic scholar in his own right, although he also published uh, texts from Persian, uh, texts from Russian, uh, clearly a, a skilled linguist and a man with broad interests. Now, just to um, appreciate the remarkable intellectual environment, it's worth considering the challenges that there were, the intellectual challenges to this meeting of the minds. On the teacher's side, there are rabbinic texts, which Shoah Sinesi certainly knew, warning against teaching of rabbinic texts to non-Jews. He simply ignored them, but there are such texts, and Shoah Sinesi um, clearly ignored them. And of course, you know, there are there have been various justifications penned for ignoring these texts uh, and other people who uh, insist on upholding this uh, these texts uh, and refuse to teach uh, the Talmud to non-Jews. In fact, some of Schiller Senesi's uh, continental colleagues were actually very unhappy with the involvement of non-Jews in Jewish studies. Uh, that that edition of the Mishnah that I, we just saw a minute ago, uh, this one. Um, evoked a review by a prominent uh, rabbinic scholar, Isaac Hirsch Weiss, 
in an annual called Ha'asif. The thrust of his review is that this manuscript is terrible and no one should have ever published it, but he concludes by saying that the Mishnah is the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob, and he emphasizes that, and we will guard it like a precious gem. Therefore, I said my piece, and I shall say wholeheartedly, this, this edition is a self-evident sham, and God forbid anyone should follow it in any matter. And his implication is very clear. Um, essentially, when Goyim get involved in studying Mishnah, bad things happen. We have to keep the Mishnah out of the hands of non-Jews. And Shosh Tanesi clearly did not agree, and uh, that is itself remarkable, although, again, I can't find a, a shred of a hint in any of his writings as to how he thought about this, whether he wrestled with it. But his practice is, is very, very clear. On the student side, I have to share one thing that I, I came upon. I think it's fascinating. Um, a generation after Schiller Senesi, a Cambridge man named William Elmsley published an annotated translation of the Mishnah treatise uh, Avodazara, idolatry, which deals with the relations between Jews and their non Jewish environment. Now, that book was reviewed in the Expositor in 1912 by the Oxford Arabist David Margulius, whose father had converted from Judaism to Anglicanism and then worked as a missionary uh, among the Jews. Now, Margulius noticed that this treatise prescribes extreme intolerance for the Jews towards their neighbors, and then he concludes the review with this paragraph. The publication of this treatise in an accessible form, in other words, this Mishnah in an accessible form, may be of considerable importance politically for the occupation of Palestine by Jewish, this is 1912, of Jewish, by Jewish communities has been going on for years. And the introduction of constitutional government into the Ottoman Empire seems to favor the extension of that occupation. Will the resettled Jews adopt towards their neighbors the attitude of extreme intolerance which this treatise prescribes? When the, when the writer, Magoliath himself, was last in Palestine, the statements made to him were rather in favor of an affirmative action to answer, I'm sorry, <laughs> affirmative answer to this question. Where the territory was occupied by Jews, there was no place for members of other communities. Mr. Elmsley's work should be studied by all whom the Zionist movement interests, and it will be all the more valuable as a contribution to Eastern politics because it, it is evident that his mind is absolutely free from anti-Semitism. And this is a chilling passage to read uh, when I came across it uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, shivers down my spine, uh, as the question of Jewish attitudes towards their neighbors in their old slash new land has proven, in fact, to be a very fraught and complex one. And this is a reminder, and not for our purposes, that when Schiller Sinesi's non-Jewish students studied Mishnah, Talmud, commentaries, they would have regularly come across teachings and laws that discriminated between Jews and non-Jews. Belief in the Trinity immediately consigned them to the Talmudic category of idolaters. And numerous laws prescribe remarkably unkind treatment to people in that category. How this was handled between the Hungarian rabbi and his British students is not known, but it was clearly handled remarkably well. With these intellectual obstacles in place, um, uh, I think one of the important things to say, and I'm getting to my last point here, is that part of Schiller Sinesi's success as a teacher cannot be disconnected from his own theology. He sincerely believed and publicly preached that Christianity is the will of God to bring civilization to the world. He argues that God, it is God's will that everyone become Christian, except for the Jews, who have been set aside to be different. And uh, just to wrap this up, I'll give you two quick examples of this, of his theological writing. So first, briefly, on two Shabbatot, two Shabbat sermons, Christmas and New Year's Day of 1858-59, when he was still in Manchester, Schiller Sinesi devoted um, to harmony and disharmony between Judaism and Christianity. And essentially, to summarize his pamphlets uh, in one line, his argument is that Trinitarianism is against both Judaism, I should say against three things, Judaism, scripture, and logic, but Unitarianism is compatible with all three. Second, uh, a very fascinating lecture at Cambridge, now in 1882, given before the Council of the Senate in the law school on Friday, April 28th, 1882. Most of the lecture uh, is an exposition, a philological exposition of the end of Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. Now this of course is the suffering servant passage. Um, and most of it is a word by word 
philological commentary on those passages. But it culminates in an argument that his Christian colleagues would have found much to their liking. And this is the last passage here. As regards the saviorship of Jesus, what have the Jews to say? I mean, of course, the thinking, the enlightened Jews, the Jews who have a religion in their heart, the Jews whose religion does not consist in the mere negation of the religion of their neighbors. Do these Jews grudge Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth his saviorship? No, a thousand times no. How could they do so? Surely every enlightened and pious Jew must see and freely acknowledge that if Jesus is no savior of those who do not believe on him, he is a savior of those who do believe on him. For what were the Gentiles before the light of Christianity rose upon them? Chaste lips cannot repeat what their own great authors write of them and their immorality. I'll skip the rest. Uh, but this is uh, a, a robust defense of how Christianity has benefited the world. So it must have been quite a relief for the gathered audience at the Cambridge Law School to hear from a Jew. In fact, the campus Jew that the Jewish reading of Isaiah 53 agreed that it was in fact a prophecy about Jesus. Now, to assess Shiloshanesi's thought, this lecture really provides a linchpin for what otherwise seems irredeemably inconsistent. He sincerely believed that God sent Jesus, sincerely believed that that had no practical import for him as a Jew. William Lowe, that student that we talked about a moment ago, summed it up in a uh, necrology for him saying, in him were combined a remarkable degree, two qualities, which are seldom found together, unquestioning faith in his own form of religion with the most large-hearted sympathy with sincere professors of all other religions. And those all other is because at the end of his life, he also uh, started to develop an interest in Islam, which he never had time to deepen. So to sum up in just two sentences, in London intellectual society, we have missionaries mocking the Talmud, and apologists presenting it in an enlightened light. In the university, and I really haven't talked about Oxford, where Neubauer worked but didn't teach and seems to have had very little uh, effect on in broader society, there was a productive circle around Schiller Senesi in Cambridge, and his personality and ideology managed to convince people that Talmud deserved attention as a monument to human thought, as well as a source for Jewish and Christian law and theology. After Shilohs death in 1890, he was replaced by Solomon Schechter, and that changes the trajectory entirely, but is also a story for another time. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Kohler. Really appreciate uh, that fascinating presentation. Um, thank you so much. It looks like uh, we have questions. So uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we'll go until about one o'clock. So um, the, I see the hand of John uh, Golden Gay, please. Well, thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you, Dr. Kohler, for this fascinating talk. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm very curious to see what you produce with respect to this, uh, uh, to this work and this topic. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, while I have everybody's attention, uh, our next uh, program for, at the Oxford Interfaith Forum will be on the 8th of February. And the speaker will be Dr. Catherine Aaron Beller from uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And the title of her talk is Christian Images and Jewish Desecrators, the History of the Allegation and Manuscript Illustrations. It is based, uh, it is a book launch uh, by her. So thank you everyone for joining. I really appreciate it. Thank you once again, Dr. Kohler and uh, everyone have a great rest of your day.